So welcome everyone to our Learning Circle webinar. We have two guest speakers with us today. Well, I'll introduce here in a moment. Um, I'm Sharon Taylor from PMMI Media Group. I'll be moderating. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So we'll get to Q&A at the end. So please feel free to put any questions that you have um, to discuss at the end. So without further ado, I'm actually going to read the bios here of our guest speakers to make sure I get everything right. So first we have jo Joyce Longfield. Joyce has a master's of science in molecular biology and began consulting in 2010 to food companies with the focus on high pressure processing, HPP, of food and beverage products. Presently, she leads the innovation with HPPY Skin's parent company, Good Foods Corp., an RTE food and beverage producer applying HPP to 100% of the ma manufactured products, including HPPY's Refresh Mask. She also sits on the board of the Cold Pressure Council since 2017, is the chair of the High Acid Juice Task Force with the Institute of Food Safety and Health, IFSH, since 2019. She sits on the board of the IFSH Scientific Advisory Committee, the SAC, since 2020, and is co-chair of the Women's Networking Group, PPWLN, this group here, since 2021. Uh, Joyce, I think you tried to stump me with all those acronyms, but hopefully I got through it uh, okay. And now we also have Heather. Heather Welpley is a speaker, award-winning author, and leadership development consultant that works with women to live, work, and lead with grounded confidence. She has spoken on discovering your authentic voice, imposter syndrome, authentic leadership, burnout recovery, and creating your own rules for success with thousands of people at different companies and conferences across the globe. Prior to owning her business, Heather worked at Cargill and Ameriprise in a wide variety of leadership development, human resources, and change management roles in both offices and plants across the US, Latin America, and Australia. Heather's first book, An Overachiever's Guide to Breaking the Rules, has won multiple awards, and her second book, Grounded Wildness, Break Free from Performing Your Life and Start Living It, was just released in October. She also hosts the Grounded Wildness podcast, and Heather lives in Colorado, where she enjoys spending as much time hiking and exploring as possible. You can learn, learn more about Heather at heatherwellplead.com and connect with her on LinkedIn. So thank you both for being here and welcome. Now, both of you have contributed to the PPWLN resource, Voices of Women in Packaging and Processing, and that covers a few different areas of communications, business acumen, networking, emotional intelligence, and negotiating negotiation skills. So we've covered some of those other topics on um, other Learning Circle webinars, which are available on the uh, PPWLN website, which can be found at pmmi.org slash PPWLN. And that's where the recording of this webinar will be posted as well. So in that resource guide, Heather, you talked a lot about you know, calming the inner critic and finding your inner voice. And Joyce, you talked about you know, real world communication examples and the, import the importance of empathizing with people who may be different from you, um, whether it be different genders, generations, um, or other differences. So branching off from that, I uh, want to dive into some questions, really focus on the topic of communications, and with a goal of you know, arming our audience with actionable steps and advice that they can take into their world, um, you know, learning how to become better communicators, um, improve their work experience and develop and grow their career. So starting off with maybe some self-reflection here. So Heather, you have talked about what some of the barriers are to sharing our authentic voices. And I know some of um, those areas that you've talked about are imposter syndrome, perfectionism, and people pleasing. So can you dig a little bit deeper into that? Maybe give us some definitions of those terms um, and just, just explain about those barriers. Absolutely, because those are three very real things that can get in the way of us sharing our voices, especially in the workplace, but honestly, it applies to all of life. So let's start with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is feeling like you don't know enough or aren't qualified enough or don't have enough experience, aren't smart enough. All, all of those things 
even when you are. And you can probably already see with that, you know, eight second definition, how that can get in the way of sharing your voice. Like if you don't feel like you know enough to share your voice, you might not share that idea. So imposter syndrome can be a huge barrier that can get in the way of sharing your authentic voice, sharing ideas, also advocating for yourself for your next career move and different pieces like that. Perfectionism is another category, which is feeling like something has to be perfect before you can share it. Or, you know, you just need to research that idea a little bit more or read the email a fourth time before you hit send or walk through that PowerPoint an eighth time before you give it to that next person to review or present it to someone. It can also show up perfectionism, like some deeper fears of making a mistake. Like I'm not allowed to make a mistake. Or what if I do speak up and I get a question I don't know the answer to? Or what if I flop on my face? What if I say the wrong thing? All of those fears can get in the way of us sharing our voices. And then people pleasing is this interesting third category in that it is one that tends to apply more to women. It kind of gets handed down as this definition of, and rules about how women are and are not supposed to show up in the world. And of course, we're challenging those and they are evolving. And yet a lot of us still feel them. And so those can feel like I'm not allowed to disappoint anyone. I can't say no. I shouldn't upset people. I shouldn't rock the boat. I look need to look like I have it all under control and kind of all of these people pleasing rules that can absolutely and honestly this is the category that's probably impacted me the most in sharing my voice and that I've had to really learn how to unwind some of these rules around like oh I shouldn't upset anyone with my voice I shouldn't be too direct and these rules I want to be really clear they don't come from inside you they feel like they do they show up in that inner critic they show up in those scripts in our minds but they didn't originate from inside of you. They come from your childhood experiences with your family and school and how your voice was and was not allowed to be used. Like, were you allowed to disagree with authority or not? Um, they come from your past work experiences. Like, did you have a, a not so good boss a few years ago who called you out for making mistakes? And if so, you might still be working hard to be, make everything perfect, even if you're on a, a more accepting team now. Um, and also bias and micro microaggressions and discrimination play into this as well, which we can talk more about if that comes up, but both related to being a woman and also intersectionally. So like white women and women of color are going to be handed different sets of rules and expectations. And those barriers really can get in the way and they're real. So I don't want to downplay them. They are real and we can let go of at least some of them as we look forward and think about how do you want to be using, using your voice. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you for that. I think that's a great way to, to set the tone for this conversation. Um, I know I saw myself nodding my head along and I imagine that our, our audience that's off screen um, was also nodding their head a lot. Um, Joyce, does any of this resonate with you? Any experiences that you can share um, related to, to some of these barriers? Um, yes. And, and I think even um, in an opposite way too, like the imposter syndrome, you know, the opposite of that would be not knowing about the subject matter in the conversation and not feeling and feeling stupid and feeling like, oh, I should know this information and I don't. And now I have to pretend like I do. And I, I think we're seeing a change in the tides of um, there's a lot of people advocating to ex show your vulnerability and say in the meeting, you know, excuse me, but I, I'm, I'm really unclear about this. And can you explain to me more, you know, to ask the question, vulnerability is a huge important piece to successful communication and making, making a connection with another person. And I think there's a, a lot of, um, you know, advice to, to ask that question and to, to demonstrate that you don't know about the subject and you're curious how I'd like to learn more. I'd like to understand more. Right. So, you know, we have different points of view today than we did even like five for 10 years ago about, you know, speaking up when you're not, you know, fully confident about what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Vulnerability, um, definitely an important piece of business communication, but can definitely be one that's, that's hard to, to figure out how to implement. Mm -hmm. um, Heather, do you have any actionable advice for our, our audience here in, in thinking about how to overcome some of these barriers? Yeah, absolutely. And some of it is starting to, to just to recognize that those barriers do exist and to not blame yourself for them. And I completely agree with Joyce that this isn't about feeling like we have to know everything or that you do know everything. That That isn't the goal, but it is to recognize where some of those rules, those barriers, that bias can get in the way and to start to notice that. 
and and to stop the self questioning and kind of start questioning everything around you, <laughs> um, and and uh, to know to know yourself better, but also to see the impact of the rules around you. The one thing that has helped me so much, I'm going to give two different things. Um, the one, the first one is around knowing what is more important than those barriers. This has gotten me through so many things. So many times I wanted to share an idea, but I wasn't sure what the feedback was that I was going to get. It's gotten me through like my second book, Grounded Wildness, is very vulnerable and it shares a lot of personal items. And I was like, oh, do I really want to share this? But when I stopped back and said, what's more important than that? There was a lot. There was a lot of why. There was a lot of purpose. And I think when we know, when you know what's important to you and what's more important than those barriers, you can use that as motivation. So like what's more important than the fear that you're feeling? What's more important than the nerves? And that might be, I want this idea that I have to potentially impact others. That might be, I need to advocate for myself so I can move ahead in my career or so I can set a boundary and have better work-life balance. There's a million different possibilities for what that could be, but getting clear for yourself in situation by situation or some undergirding, you know, bigger lines of purpose of kind of what you bring can help to find the motivation to speak up even when those barriers are there. So that's one that has been, I ask myself that question all the time, whenever nerves come up, whenever the barriers are there, because they're real. And I was in you know corporate jobs for 10 years, over 10 years, and I experienced them as well. I got feedback that I could be too direct and it really made me question uh, my voice. And so I've had to come back to this, what's more important over and over again. The second part that's been so helpful <laughs> is grounding myself in my own body. So when I feel like my mind is being a little hijacked or I get thrown off my game, is just coming in and putting my feet on the, the ground, putting my hands on my legs or on the table and taking a breath all the way down into my lower belly and letting it out. And that's something that anyone can do in the middle of a meeting and no one even has to know that you're doing it. So that combination of knowing what's most important and then grounding yourself physically in your body, I've found to be a really magical combination in getting through the barriers and speaking up. Great. Love that. Um, I, there's a lot of power in what you said here. I think so three, you had two things, but also something you said earlier. So you know, grounding it and knowing your purpose. So it's like, what's more important? Is it giving into the barriers or, you know, do you have a greater purpose in, in getting your, um, your thoughts out? Um, also, when you talked about, you know, these rules weren't created by you, I think that's important to realize too. Sometimes we can be hard on ourselves. So to, you know, embrace the fact that, you know, this, this was not a world created by you. So it gives you something maybe to fight against, um, that's outside of you. <clears throat> so I think that can be really powerful. And then love that actionable step two of, of the physical grounding um, is very, I, th I imagine can be very helpful in that physical environment, you know, in-person meetings. Um, so great. Thank you for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about feedback and how feedback can contribute to improving our communication. Um, but how do we go about soliciting feedback and what do we do with it once we get it? So um, either one of you, if you want to jump in with uh, feedback on that question. Joyce, I just spoke. Would you like to share first? <laughs> I, I Sure. And, um, you know, as someone similarly be, like, consulted for a long time with a number of companies and then transitioned, you know, um, with, a, with a company in a full-time way, there, the styles and the types and the variety of feedback is all over the place. And one of the things that I've learned, and you, you really just touched on it, self-awareness. Self-awareness is just really such a key goal to becoming better at communication. And really what I, what I learned was that in the moment of receiving some kind of feedback, you know, you, you're going to be triggered in some way. And oftentimes when we hear that word trigger, we typically associate it with a negative reaction, like, like that triggered me in a way that made me feel bad about myself. Some, but really, truly, like you could be triggered and like, you feel really good about yourself. Like they just gave you a really great compliment and stuff. So it's a trigger either which way. And, and really in that moment, like when you are triggered, like 
where is that coming from? What, what, how is that making me feel? What, what is that? So if it, especially if it's a negative trigger, right? You know, that person most likely is not trying to be harsh or mean or hurt your feelings, but yet it's triggered something in you. So really it is our responsibility to kind of go inside and, and identify like, where is that coming from? And because as you mentioned, a lot of the way we are comes from our childhood. And so that, that is one thing that I've learned to in becoming better at communication is really to identify like what was what was the skill set that I was born or raised with and now what do I have control of because we don't have control of the other person we can't force the other person to think a certain way or respond to you a certain way you only have control of yourself so that's where I try and manage and, and improve on my skill set for or communication and even to this day I still actually I, th I think even more so now today especially having a teenager in the house I've really learned how valuable it is to be able to effectively communicate with her um, to not fight and I have noticed that 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 work that I'm doing the, in that area of my life is actually improving a lot of the like work relationships and not that there were bad things but I just noticed that it's making it that much better how I'm speaking to my colleagues you know and so I, I think that it is important to sort of self-reflect on why are you feeling this way where does this come from you know can I address it in some way or can I be aware of it that the next time I get some feedback from someone like not not to feel hurt right because you can kind of tell your brain like, hey, that, that's coming from a place in my past and I'm no longer that person. I'm this person and what this person who's giving me this feedback now is offering me an opportunity to work on this. You know, so just because it's something that you were raised a certain way doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be for the rest of your life. And that's how I look at feedback is, oh, here's here's something that it's an opportunity for me to now change uh, about myself right so i just you know would encourage people to like reflect on why it's making them feel the way that it's feeling inside mm -hmm. yeah um and heather do you have anything to add either on on how to solicit feedback or maybe taking you know one step further from what joyce is talking about of like what do you do with that feedback and you know how do you put it into practice yeah, I have a few thoughts on both of those. So the, the thing I want to share about feedback, and I, I love what Joyce said, kind of the evolution of we're allowed to continually evolve and we don't have to carry everything with us that we've had with us in the past. I think that's so important. Also, when we're getting feedback, the thing that's been really helpful to me is recognizing that some of it is incredibly important and helpful and is going to help you on that next journey. And some of it's not and trying to be discerning between those two. And it's not always an easy thing to do, but I'll give an example. I mentioned before that I had gotten feedback that I could be too direct. Part of that was helpful. Like it was helpful for me to have an awareness that I do have a direct style of communication. At that time, I was also living in Minnesota, upper Midwest is not the most direct place. My style of communication probably would have been fine in Manhattan, but it wasn't as good in Minnesota. And that was good for me to have an awareness of that. It wasn't good for me to take it so to heart and to believe that every single part of it was true or to hold back my voice or to get anxious about sharing a direct opinion or my direct voice when I did share it. And so it would have been much better for me to be discerning and say, okay, what part of this is helpful and what part isn't? Because the thing about feedback is that every single piece of feedback you get, praise, constructive criticism, anything across the spectrum is coming from that person's perspective. And that doesn't make it any more less right or wrong. It's just from their perspective. So it can be really helpful to take a step back and say, what's useful here? What's not useful? What do I want to carry with me? And what don't I want to carry with me? And to do so in a way that hopefully isn't defensive either, because sometimes, oh, I don't want to listen to that. <laughs> it's different than, oh, I need to listen to that. I just don't really like it. Um, sometimes that's the hardest feedback that we do need to listen to. So be discerning in, in your feedback and know that it can be really, really helpful. The piece around how to solicit feedback, I found particularly when it comes to um, communication, sometimes we have blind spots we don't know about, or you become aware of those blind spots, and then you want to get feedback on them. For example, I worked with a woman, I'm a coach as well, and I worked with a woman who she did, her facial expressions just didn't line up with like the words coming out of her mouth. They just did it. And so she really wanted to work on how her facial expressions and body language were being interpreted by others. 
And that's hard to do on your own inside your own head. So she would tell, she told a few trusted colleagues, you know, this is what I'm working on. So I'm going to come to you regularly for feedback on this specific thing. And certainly there's other ways to ask for feedback. But I think when it comes to communication, if you can tell a few people, I'm working on this. So can you be on the lookout for that for me? Am I doing it this way? How are people interpreting it? How am I working on that? And then you can circle back with them and say, you know, in that meeting, how did I come across? Or that thing that I was working on, did you see me doing it? Did you see me not doing it? What are your thoughts on that? And giving people something specific to look for is going to make it a lot easier for them to give that feedback. And it's probably going to be more helpful for you as well. Mm -hmm. And another example, sorry to interrupt you, uh, just another example that I would say in a different style of feedback, like let's say you're presented with something that you don't agree with, you know, in a more classical form. One of the ways that I've kind of approached it is to, you know, kind of in a way like first compliment them. Oh, that's really interesting how, how you came to that conclusion. Um, can you tell me more about that? You know, I'm really curious. I'd like to understand that a little bit better because if that was me, I would have done it this way. Like, you know, like it just so you kind of you, instead of just jumping right in and be like, huh, why'd you do it like that? You know, so even like the way that you present in that type of feedback, right? Because again, uh, most of the time, like commu uh, communication is sort of in a way like a negotiation and a negotiation is never about coming out like zero sum game, right? It's about like, how do we both get to the place that we want to go? And, you know, stepping back to what Heather was saying, uh, a big part of communication is sort of reading the room, right? So she might not speak a certain way in upper, you know, mid Midwest Minnesota than she would in Manhattan. So that classic, like reading the room, what is the right tone for, for this conversation is still a very important factor in communication. Mm -hmm. um, and so that comes to uh, my next question for you, Joyce, is how do you approach communicating with people that have different communication preferences um, or challenges compared to you, whether that be because there are a different gender or generation or just general differences? Well, I, I have found, you know, it for me anyways, and this is how I started when I was consulting and I'd have to go into a boardroom, which was mainly with a lot of men, to listen for a while, to like really listen to how people speak, what their body language is like. So be very observational, you know, ask some questions about them, get curious about them to start to build that connection between them. Because again, like, you know, being able to get someone to be vulnerable with you starts to build trust. And trust is a huge component to having successful conversations. Um, the other thing that Heather mentioned, a lot of times, you know, when things start to get to like an emotional place, it's now not about the subject anymore. Right. So having control of your emotions. And if you see someone that is getting upset in the middle of a conversation, you know, to try and calm that down, you can even say things like, you know, I see this is really upsetting you. Like, can you tell me more? What's coming up for you? Like, what what is it about this decision that you're not liking? You know, like, just be curious with them. Right. And try and have that emotional connection. But if you walk into a room full of strangers, you do need a moment to kind of like read that room, gauge your audience. So listening, asking questions before you start speaking and dictating, I think is, is a really important factor. Yeah. And so I know, you know, Heather mentioned the different communication in Minnesota. Now we know that within the packaging and processing industry, it tends to be male dominated. Joyce, curious for you, has that impacted your communication? how you communicate with others? I think I had a little bit of an advantage with a science background because we can just be very like robotic at times, you know, it can be very unemotional, which, you know, a stoic approach in a male audience for a woman can be very beneficial as long as you sort of don't cross a line where you come off as cold or like uncaring and stuff. So the words that you use and, and, and how you speak to one another, right? So I think there's a lot of benefit to that. And it definitely took me a, a far way in my career, like it helped a lot. But as I've gotten to this place in my life, again, using my family, you know, interactions with my husband and, and my teenager um, has really made me reflect like, oh, 
I still have work to do on becoming a better communicator. I, I was just, I think, at a place where I was doing so well professionally that I thought, oh, I, I'm good. You know, like, I, I don't, I don't need to improve on this area. And then I realized in my own self being triggered by my husband and my daughter that I, I was, I wasn't responding in the right way to them. So working on that communication in my home started to make my communication at work even better. And not that there was really anything wrong with it, but it just got so much better, which mm -hmm. I think is like, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I made that effort and realized that we always have room to grow on areas that we think we're really good at. Yeah. There's nothing like teenagers to knock you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so Heather, um, what can you share with us about maybe some of those differences, if it's gender or generational, and then just how, how to balance, you know, how do we then still show up authentically for ourselves while balancing, you know, knowing how others might have different communication styles? Yeah, it's such a good question because there is a balance there. I don't think there's no way that you can just force like everyone's going to listen to me in my own style forever. <laughs> um, and also, I don't believe that we should have to twist and turn ourselves into someone that we're not in order to get heard. So I think there is a balance there between those two. And I like what Joyce was saying too, about reading the room and observing and seeing where people are coming from. And for me in my career, I've, I've seen that mostly on a cross-cultural basis. So we are obviously in the United States have many cultures, but I've also worked in uh, across the globe, living in Latin America and Australia and just working for global companies where I was interacting with people who had both a very wide variety of cultural expectations around communication and often weren't um, weren't operating in their native language, which makes it you know, more challenging as well. And there was absolutely a give and take there of me trying to listen more, to learn more, to understand where people were coming from, to see what other people's triggers were and hopefully doing the same, them doing the same for me. Um, I love what Joyce said. You've mentioned that question twice, Joyce, which is, can you tell me more? And I think that is such a magical question to just learn more about where people are coming from, what ideas they're sharing, what feedback it is, whatever it might be. And, and I think you can, you can dive into that. I also say there's there's not an easy answer to this question of like when do you kind of stick to your guns and really be authentic or be direct or whatever it is for you. And sometimes it's the opposite too. Like I got that feedback that I was too direct. I've had a lot of women tell me when I've done a speaking engagement that that, that wasn't their challenge. They've gotten feedback that like they're on the more introverted side and they basically need to become an extrovert and be more, be more forthright and to share their ideas and to put themselves out there more. And you get to decide to a degree. You get to decide what is going to work for you, knowing that, of course, there are always outcomes to what you decide. Um, but you get to decide like how much do I, I want to change myself? Where am I not willing to just be quiet? I had a friend once who was sharing an idea and um, she noticed that whenever she shared an idea that her boss didn't, didn't agree with, he said, I want you to pick your battles. It's really important for you to pick your battles. And she was like, I am, this is the battle that I am picking. And it was a very interesting observation that he was giving her that feedback whenever she spoke up against something that he disagreed with. And she got to decide in that moment, you know, am I going to take that feedback and I'm gonna be quiet here or am I going to stick to it and say, no, this is a battle that I've chosen. This is something I'm going to speak up about. This is important to me. So there's not a right or wrong answer for anyone here who's listening. It's a personal decision to weigh where you're coming from, where others are coming from, and the importance of the situation at hand. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how the, how one might think about that in, say, like manager relationships versus peers? Yeah. I know I took a a training course long ago is so long ago that it was on managing millennials, um, which I know now we've got a, a new generation coming up, but it, it talked about kind of like a 70, 30 of, you know, manager sets like 70% of the communication, but then they need to come down 30% to, you know, the people they're managing their level. So that's a very you know precise way of, of thinking about it. But do you have thoughts on, on just that balance between communicating with, with managers versus peers or anyone else in the organization? Absolutely. I think so. I've never heard it quite that precise, the 70-30, but I do think there is a difference. And one of the questions I found to be helpful to ask is not just how important like is this feedback or is this expectation, but also how important is the person that's giving it to me? Like, 
can this person, what, what level of influence does this person have over your career, over whether you're going to get promoted, over whether your idea is going to be heard to other people, um, and, and how important is the relationship at hand? And again, those are questions that you have to answer on a personal level, but I do think they are things to be, you know, to take into consideration. If your, if your boss is, who has great influence is an influential person in the organization and is your direct manager, if they're giving you some feedback, again, you get to decide whether you agree with it or not. And at the same time, if you choose to totally ignore that feedback, there might be consequences of that. And you get to decide whether those consequences are worth it. But knowing knowing the importance of the relationship of the person, of the influence they have, can be a great point, one point of consideration in that. Mm -hmm. And I so, think, too, oh, sorry, I just want to comment that I think, too, it's also the way that you present it, right? And Heather, you mentioned your friend that, that her boss would always shoot her down. And I'd be curious about like the way that she presented it. And um, just the other day, I had a colleague of mine who wanted to um, evolve her role to take on more responsibility. And her boss, he had said no, like shot her down because then technically she'd actually have more responsibility than him. And it, in a way she interpreted his no as, I think he felt a little threatened that she would sort of have like, like greater power for lack of better way of describing it within the organization. And she, and I asked her what she was gonna do about it. And she's like, well, I'm just really bummed. And you know, I don't wanna go to his boss because I don't want her to think that I'm complaining about him. I said. Well, if you go and you complain, then that's exactly how she's going to take it. But if you go and say, I have a leadership role in this company, it is my responsibility to act as a leader. And right now, I see that if it was structured as such, this would be beneficial to the company overall. There's a cost saving benefits here. There's this, I said, so it, it's you can present it as a complaint, and then take the results of that. But you can also present it in a way that will be heard and will be listened in a totally differently. And really, like, you know, obviously you want to maintain healthy relationships. But even that person who's her boss, if he's going to be offended by that, that's kind of his responsibility to address that within himself. Why does he feel threatened? So you do have to be able to discern between, like, when am I doing things out of an emotional reaction? When am I doing things that are truly the professional thing to do? And when do I have to let go of feeling guilty for someone else's responsibility of, of themselves to deal with, right? And that's kind of where I saw that situation. And I just said to her, I'm like, you have a factual, very logical reason here to present this. And if he is upset about it after, that's, that's his own responsibility to work on that that is not because of you you're not presenting this to get back at him or there's nothing malicious in this mm -hmm. and as a leader I would expect that type of of stepping up for the company to present that so I think like it's important to understand you know like you you can't take responsibility for other people's emotions and reactions you know you can only take responsibility for your own yeah, I have to jump in here really quick because I just want to say it has been a huge learning for me that last point that you're talking about, Joyce, around I can't be responsible for other people's reactions. I can be responsible for presenting whatever I'm presenting in a healthy, emotionally intelligent yeah. way. And also, sometimes it's okay if people get upset. It's a, sometimes it's okay if people don't like what I'm saying or don't like yeah. me for a moment because of what I'm saying. And that has been, I will say, a recent realization for me and a huge thing that I that I have worked through. And it just felt really good to work through it because that can hold us back so much if we are carrying, carrying the weight of other people's reactions when they 90% of the time have nothing to do with us. So I, I love that you pointed that out. Well, and I think to 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 that point, um, a, and a part of effective communication does also have to be that after part of the communication. If you did offend someone, I think one thing to give you the confidence in to be able to speak up when you know that something is professionally or factually accurate, and yes, it might result in offending someone, how well is your, your capabilities to repair, right? And so if you feel confident that, you know, I know I might say this, 
But if I do upset this person, I am comfortable in going and having a conversation with them to repair that relationship. Because that repair is a very important part of communication. Yeah. It's a good, good keyword there. Um, I think we've had a lot of good talking about vulnerability and repairing relationships, um, grounding, which I know Heather is one um, very central to, to you and your business. Um, so we do, we've got a few minutes left before getting to a couple of questions, but I wanted to get to a few more questions on really getting into the, the actionable steps. And Heather, I know you've got a lot of great content around, you know, showing up in meetings, um, uh, you know, um, taking back uh, an interruption. So we'd love to hear some, some advice for our audience here on, on managing that. Absolutely. And I'll say that I share these, these couple, I'll share three tips here and I share them all in my keynote, my presentation on discovering your authentic voice. And they are just, there are three things that anyone can take away, whether you're in a meeting or a one-on-one -on -one conversation or anything. So the first place on, you know, how can you get heard and in a, a stronger way is to take up some space, like whether you're in a virtual meeting, you know, turning on your camera, if people have their cameras on so that people can see you, it's easier to be seen when you're heard. I'm sorry, it's easy to be heard when you're seen or when you're in an in-person meeting, you know, you're allowed to take up the space of your body. That's, you don't have to put everything into a tiny little pile in front of you and roll your shoulders in. You're allowed to take up the space of your body. Or if you're in a hybrid meeting where you're like the two, you're one of two people who's virtual and then eight people are in a room together, it's hard. It's challenging. And that sometimes means taking up space can be jumping in towards the end or the middle of the conversation and saying, hey, I have something to add there. I have a question or I have an idea that I want to add before we move on to the next part of the conversation. So taking up space energetically and physically um, can be a really helpful point in getting heard. Another one is to get an ally. So this we don't talk about a lot and you can get an ally on an ongoing basis or simply if you know you're gonna be going into a meeting where maybe you're presenting or you're gonna be sharing a dissenting opinion about something and that ally can, they can take back interruptions for you which I'll get to in a second. They can ask a question to dive deeper. They can ask that question that Joyce has said multiple times like, can you tell me more about that? That's really interesting or that's an interesting thought. I hadn't heard about that before. And just creating some space for your voice to be heard. And then on the taking back interruptions, you know, we know it's very well researched that women are interrupted more, listen to less, and particularly in that interruption space. So what do you do? What do you do when you're interrupted? I have two phrases that I found to be very helpful for people, particularly if you're just starting out or you're uncomfortable taking back that interruption. And you can use them either in the exact moment or you can wait until that person has finished and then say these. And one of them is, I haven't finished speaking yet. And the second one is I have more to say on that. So you're not shutting the other person down. You're just guiding the conversation back so that you can complete your thought, your idea, your question, your disagreement, whatever it is that you are sharing and really turn the space and the energy back over to you. And you can use these with family, with friends, with colleagues, with leaders in a meeting with 20 people or in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can use all three of those tips in, in all of those types of situations. Great. I love, I love that. I have more to say on that one. I feel like that's gets, you know, you can use it after, like you said, after someone's finished speaking, but you know, before people move on, um, taking back that conversation and two of the ally, I know, um, I've heard it often of situations where, you know, a woman says something in a meeting and it kind of goes, you know, falls on deaf ears. And then a man might kind of regurgitate that or say verbatim that same thing. And then it's like, Oh, you know, Jim had a really great idea. I think having allies is a great way to, you know, have someone say like, actually, you know, I think Heather had just made that point earlier. Um, so just another, another call out to the importance of allies. Um, well, I know we're getting close to the end here. So we'll cover, um, we've got a couple of questions that we'll cover in a few minutes, but as, as we get towards a wrap up, um, would love to hear from each of you, any resources that you recommend on, you know, how we can think about improving our communication, um, whether it's, you know, books, blogs, podcasts. Um, Heather, I know you personally have all of those as well as speaking engagements and, and coaching. So um, we'd just love to hear, you know, any resources to to share with the group. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, can, I can. Oh, go ahead. Joyce, go no, ahead. I was going to say, I, I think like, it's wonderful to have Heather on here because that 
that accessibility to podcasts, audiobooks, all like I love reading, but we don't all have time to sit there and read. And if you drive a lot, then it's a great time because there is just such a world out there now that we didn't have, you know, even five years ago. Like we're so lucky to have the resources that we have and communication it is a muscle that can be trained just like any other part of your body it's just a matter of you like doing the work taking the putting in the effort and and also you know we've talked a lot about verbal communication and you kind of started to touch on it there a little bit at the end Heather that you know it's really important to recognize that you need to convey that type of language in your electronic communication too Right. So in, in your emails and in your texting, and again, we're so fortunate with tools like AI, if anyone uses Microsoft and they have Copilot, you can have Copilot now edit your email and it'll tell you, you know, the tone of your email is a little bit like aggressive and maybe try saying this and it'll give you suggestions. Like there was a study done that demonstrated how if someone in, let's say like a texting thread uses a lot of please and thank yous, that it calms all the other people in the texting thread, the more please and thank yous you throw out there. And there's a big difference between saying thanks and I'm so grateful for this information. I'm so grateful for you. I appreciate you. Like it does make a difference when you use other forms of expressing your gratitude than just thanks, right? So just keep that in mind. Yeah, great. Heather, how about you? How about some resources? Yeah, I'll jump in. So one, I want to say, if you are listening, you want to bring more of what what we've been talking about today into your organization (laughs) or an employee resource group or for a leadership event. Um, I have presentations on discovering your authentic voice on imposter syndrome and on leading with grounded confidence that all overlap with what we've been talking about today. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn um, or my website's heatherwelpley.com to learn more about those as well. And then on a personal level, so yes, my podcast Grounded Wildness recently has had several episodes related to this. We have one uh, that was like a 45 minute episode on how to get heard in meetings just last week was an, a guest and she talked about how to stop apologizing when you have nothing to apologize for. Uh, we had another one recently on becoming a change maker, which is part of using your voice is creating and influencing change. So there's been a lot of great topics on grounded wildness lately related to exactly what we're talking about today. And then if you relate to the, particularly some of those things we've talked about at the beginning around feeling like you have to people please or perfect or prove yourself and you feel the weight of those rules, whether it's related to your voice and shit speaking up or any other part of your life, um, Grounded Wildness in particular is going to be a great book for you. You can get it on my website or it's on Amazon ebook, audiobook, and hardcover. So if you are someone who likes to listen in the car, um, I read the audiobook so you can you can get that as well. And then we'll follow up too. There's two articles that one I contributed to and one that I just read recently that will be in your follow-up email. One is the new rules of executive presence. It's a Harvard Business Review article that is, I thought, really interesting. And it does talk about um, how confidence and decisiveness are still at the top of the list for executive presence. However, authenticity, inclusiveness are now on the list. And 20 years ago, they were not. So 20 years ago, authenticity was not on the list of criteria for how we consider someone to have executive presence. And now it is, which I feel like is a huge, <laughs> is a huge step forward that that's being considered um, as part of our, our own executive presence. And then another article that I was able to contribute to on essentially how to voice dissenting opinions at work. And there was a, a bunch of different people contribute to that article and give some really great perspectives. So lots of different ways that you can follow up both for yourself personally and for your organization as a whole. So feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions about any of that. Great. So lots of great resources. Um, speaking of Harvard, Harvard Business Review, um, I would also plug the Women at Work um, HBR podcast. They've got a lot of great content there as well. Um, and if we can squeeze in a couple of questions here and one related to confidence. So you just talked about that executive presence. Um, so how do you balance when, let me see if I can get the question exactly right here. Um, So for women in particular, sometimes we try too much to not be a know-it-all, too direct, and end up not sounding as confident as you should. So how how can we balance that? 
So my immediate, the, the thing that has been so helpful for me is actually what I mentioned right at the beginning, which is grounding myself in my body. So I have found that when I come from a calm place in my body, I can say the same thing and it's going to come across as strong and confident, but not aggressive. And it's the exact same thing. It's like, I'm, I'm coming from this deep source of power within me that isn't attacking. It's just like an inner truth coming out, if that, if that makes any sense. And I've found that when I can come from that place, I am, I'm calmer and I'm more powerful at the same time. And, and that for me has been a huge help because what you're talking about, this person's talking about is very real. Like, you know, you, you get that feedback that you're, you need to speak up more, but then when you do, you get told that you're too direct or aggressive or even angry. And so those things are very real. What I just shared is not a cure-all, but it has been without a doubt, the most helpful thing for me in grouping within myself to come from a place of power that is calm, collected power. Yeah. And one thing, one thing that I've observed, um, and again, I think I have the benefit being on the science side, I often always will use uh, references for where this comes from. And I'll even open up and say like, oh, I was reading this article. And now 99% of the times I'm reading a scientific article. But often I've found that when I presented things of more from my my opinion and my perspective, it isn't always as valued as much as something that is rooted in science. And so, you know, even if you use language like, you know, I really like this because it's unbiased, right? So then it kind of presents to the person like, I'm even taking my own opinion out of the equation. I'm just giving you the facts, right? And so it kind of puts them in a place where they can't really argue with you that you're wrong in what you're stating because you are presenting to them things that are factually sound and it's not just your, your opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and if we t have time here for another question, I think this touches on something, Joyce, you said earlier about you know, evolving your communication and, you know, you kind of thought you had it all down, but realizing it's a continual process. So any tips for, you know, honing and sharpening our communication skills, just as we evolve, maybe moving into management and leadership roles, um, any, anything actionable there to share with the group? I, th I think if you take that self-reflection first to kind of see like what it is that I need to work on where before you actually tackle something, it is a lot easier for our brains to build a new habit than to try and change or undo an old habit. And if you're uh, if you ever read that book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, you know, that helps you kind of explain a lot how you build new habits within yourself. But you still kind of need to know first what it is that you have to work on. So you do have to do a little bit of internal self-reflection. Uh, I just fortunately had a teenager in my life to point out exactly what I needed to work on. <laughs> that that helps a lot when you have somebody who points that out to you. And, and when you love that person, you don't take it as offensively than if you do a colleague when they point out your flaws. So, so yeah, I think it's important to do some self-reflection and really decide like what what is it that you want to build a new habit on? Mm -hmm. um, and if we have time for just one more questions, I know we try to end at about 45 minutes, but I think we just have one more. So um, we talked a little bit about, you know, communication with communicating differently with different people, whether it's um, gender or um, generation or anything else. So there was a specific question of, um, do you think that we should be communicating differently between men and women? So do you, do either of you communicate differently when you're speaking to a man or a woman, whether that's written or in person? Um, yes. I do. Yeah. do you, Heather? You know, it's an interesting question. I think I, I think I do a little bit. I'm not quite sure how to articulate it, but I have noticed even in common things like, like I like to play pickleball and I've noticed that my energy is a little different when I'm on a court with three men rather than mixed gender or all women. And it's neither one is bad. Neither one feels inauthentic. Um, mm -hmm. but something, there is something that's a little bit different, um, that I, I can't quite put my finger on. And I noticed it too. Like I used to do trainings inside of you know, out in plants. And so about half the time, I would say, or a third of the time I was in front of an all male group. It was like the leadership team at the plant. 
And then the other, you know, half to two thirds of the time, it was all gender. And there was definitely a different energy. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes I liked that energy. Like it was a fun, it wasn't a negative thing at all. But yeah, there was a slight difference that did not feel inauthentic, just slightly different. Um, so the answer is yes, but I can't quite put my finger on exactly how. Joyce, do you want to add anything to that? No, and I think actually what you point out, it's okay that it is different. It's not inauthentic, you know, and it's necessary sometimes. Again, it's all part of like reading the room, right? And understanding the audience that you're speaking to and who you're talking to. And like when I would take, meetings that you know again with a large group of men and I'd come back and my husband would be like you're very masculine for a couple days after I come back from these board meetings and it would like almost just need time to deflate and it's interesting because in general I think we as women acknowledge that men can be louder and more overbearing right and and it's hard I don't I don't have a huge voice and am I therapist describes it in a really great way. And I'm a visual person, you know, like when my husband would get triggered, he's like a genie that comes out of a bottle and he gets real big and fills up a room. And I just kind of like, will sit there and dig my heels in and be firm until he deflates. But that's not very effective. I had to find a way to help him deflate and calm down. And I realized that like, I was really good at doing that in the boardroom, like when a gentleman would get, you know, raise his voice or get upset. And it didn't bother me. It bothered me when it was my husband, because I'm emotionally attached to him. and I'm not emotionally attached. So I kind of had to learn, like, you know, this balance and what that's doing inside of me in order to make our relationship better. And then again, it's like, understanding that about myself started to make my professional relationships better as well. So it is absolutely okay to interact with men and women different. And I think it's a bit of a survival skill, to be honest. Yeah. And Joyce, can I just say, I love your mention of talking to your therapist. I think that's so great to put out there and that's a great resource for us all to have um, another resource and ally. So um, thank you for that. Um, so I know we're, we're kind of over our like unofficial time, but if, if in just, you know, a minute or two, um, a minute each, I know I'm giving you not a lot of time. If you can just share what you think are some of the, the key takeaways from our discussion today, Heather, how about we start with you? Sure. I think there's been a lot of great tidbits and things shared. And I, I think part of what I, what I'm hearing overarchingly is one, there's a lot of things that are a personal decision. So that taking, you know, raising your own self-awareness, which Joyce talked a lot about that. And I really appreciate that. So raising your own self-awareness, understanding what is yours to carry and what came from outside of you, um, and then making a decision about how you want to show up, how you want to communicate, where you need to make changes and improve, where you want to, where you want to stay in your own style. And, but taking all of that data and information in, and raising your self-awareness and then making making the decision and that it can be flexible um, situation by situation too. And that doesn't mean you're being fake or inauthentic. You, you know how that feels to you um, and what feels good and right and aligned to you. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it even starts with when you're self-aware, even showing up at like this, I, I mean, if you're showing up today saying, I'm not good at communicating, so I'm going to take this webinar to, to become better. That's okay. It would be better for you to say something to yourself like, I used to not be very good at communicating, but I'm getting better and I'm mm -hmm. learning and I'm putting in the effort, which you are if you are showing up to something like this today. So it really does start with us and how you're talking to yourself. That's going to carry over on how you talk to other people. So talk to yourself in a positive way. I'm doing a good job. I'm becoming a better communicator. And slowly but surely it will, especially if you equip yourself with like all the amazing resources out there. So I would encourage um, every listener to follow up with Heather, you know, go online, do some podcasts. Like there's just, it absolutely is a muscle that you can train. Agree. 
Well, thank you both so much, Joyce and Heather, um, for sharing your, your tips, your experiences, your vulner vulnerability. Um, we appreciate you. And thank you all for attending. Um, we will have a recording of this sent out uh, or a link sent out or it'll be posted, but definitely check out pmmi.org slash PPWLN. You'll get um, all the resources there. And um, also don't forget to check out all of Heather's great resources at heatherwelpley.com. So thank you all and have a great day. Bye guys. Have a good day.